Hello and thanks for coming to our talk. Um, we, uh, I'm Andrew Harmel Law. I run the Java team in Capgemini in the UK. Um, I've been a like a fanboy of DDD for perhaps five years, and I've been kind of doing it on and off in various projects that I've worked on. Um, and I've been doing distributed systems probably most of my career, but I've been doing hyper-distributed, kind of microservice-based systems approaches for two to two and a half years. And that's hopefully kind of the area that we're going to talk to you about today. Hi, um, I'm Gayatri, and I'm a senior software engineer in Capgemini's engineering team. Uh, just to give a little more background about us and uh, what we have done in this area. So Andrew and I work for the same client who is a global parcels operator. We have built up a microservice architecture for them for the past two years. So we started off with a small piece of work which was just a single microservice. But then more and more projects followed which were far more significant to the clients. So naturally that involved more microservice to microservice communication. When we started on our previous project, which was to um, develop a shared payment service for our clients' e-business applications, we faced some of the problems that anyone starting on a new microservice project can easily relate to, which was A, how do we split our application into microservices? B, what's our core model and how do we identify it? And finally, how do we organize our teams around these? Now, Andrew and I have attended um, domain driven course in the past, and we are quite familiar with the concepts. So we thought this would be an ideal opportunity to put those concepts into practice. Now, we are the integration team, so we develop APIs in this project. And this is not normally where you would see DDD being applied, um, but we want to show that even here, you can see a lot of benefits if you apply the strategic and tactical patterns right. You'd think integration, that's easy, right? But there are some harder aspects to it, and that's why we should know our bounded context, and that's very important. And recently, Andrew and I are also working on another project which migrates a bunch of APIs, which are implemented um, using BPM software to use an open source integration framework. And again, in this project, we are fully leveraging the benefits of DDD. So we now have about 16 services in production and a few more in the pipeline ready to be shipped. So um, we just want to be explicit as well. So this is, we think is quite important for, you know, you guys in the audience kind of evaluating and deciding whether or not you agree with what we, um, what we tell you about and why we think it's successful. We didn't build these services ourselves. We didn't do the integration. So we're just two people from the team who've pulled together this talk. Um, these are some of, but not all of, the rest of the team. So you can see that there's people from, not just from the UK, there's guys out in India um, who obviously can all get together and stand in one photograph, as opposed to us who uh, like only like taking photographs on our own. We are um, people who have, are being put through a degree at Capgemini. So we've got guys who are doing higher apprenticeships. So the guy who's got the animated GIF, he was a fully you know, contributing member of the team. So it's not a thing which is only a senior devs can, can uh, kind of do. Um, there's other people in the team who've been there a long time, been there doing software development longer than I have. The, the last thing to bear in mind is that we, um, we had, the team did not kind of start up at the same size that it finished up now. So people um, joined the team gradually, the team grew, the team got smaller again when we had less work to do, the team grew up in size again. So we had people moving through the team. So again, so lots of the kind of making the architecture explicit and making things like our core model explicit was far more important for us because we didn't have the stability of a bunch of people who knew each other all the time and had worked with, with, with each other before. So hopefully this kind of gives you the indication that it's the benefits we talk about are real benefits, not, you know, 10x developer kind of benefits. So, so with that in mind, um, we're talking, what we're talking about, we know um, can be applied to, to distributed systems in many different forms. So domain-driven design came about well before the word microservice was ever invented. And what's interesting is, if you go back and read the book, it reads as if it was written right now, because a lot of the terminology is, is there, but it's just not using the word microservice. But because microservices are what we're talking about, it's helpful if we define what we mean, because everyone seems to have a slightly different view. So we stole a slide from Adrian Cockcroft, where I steal all my good slides from. Um, and so he defines microservices as a loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded contexts, which is good, 
but it's kind of very high level. So if we break it down, we stole this picture from Sam Newman's really good book, Building Microservices. So Sam identifies a bunch of things. The first five things here pretty much drill into the loosely coupled aspect. So autonomous small services, they hide implementation details, decentralize everything, deploy independently, isolate failure. These are all just you know, what you get if you loosely couple things. The next one is highly observable, which we probably won't talk about a great deal, but you need to definitely do if you're doing microservices and culture of automation. Again, you can't do it without it, but we don't care for this talk. The thing we do care about is that they're modeled around business concepts. So this, it, it, so as Guy said, it's kind of, it's most important for us because we don't build software for ourselves, we build it for our clients. So by definition, we don't have a great understanding at the very start when, of what their business is. So this is why things like domain-driven design are are fundamental because it makes us learn as much as possible about the business of the thing that we're trying to build the problem, the build a solution for. And so that's where we, we're going to talk about the DDD aspect. So what do we think about microservices given the past two years experience implementing it? We think they're awesome because they coexist and at the same time they can evolve independent of each other. They are reusable, they are disposable and devopsable. And it's hard not to mention their size. So they're scrum team sized and also human sized, meaning a developer starting on a project can hit the ground running on the very first day. But most importantly, they bring the interconnectivity of the system to the surface and makes it explicit to all the team members. And last but not the least, they keep the technical debt isolated and manageable. So as you can see, even without hundreds of instances and the standard stack, you can see a lot of benefits with microservices. But this is so if anyone saw my talk yesterday, this is the second time I'm using this. So Gathry said they make your interconnectivity evident. This is what they make evident. So this is the, the kind of slightly terrifying Netflix view with all of the interconnectivity of their, their microservices made evident. What you can see is by splitting up this big thing where you've always had the interconnectivity, but it was implicit, you've made it explicit. And if you've got a lot of interconnectivity, you'll see it. So you've also now got a lot more moving parts and they're independent. So we just saw microservices are hard, but what's hardest are the boundaries. So with microservices, changes do ripple across services. That goes with the territory. But getting the split wrong means the impact of these changes can be huge. Sam Newman recognizes this in his book on building microservices, and this is a quote from his book. But what we also recognized was how much the teams need to communicate in order to build these services. So if you get that wrong, as Sam points out, it can indeed be an expensive operation. But there is things that come to the rescue. So it's obvious that we're going to talk about DDD, but, but to, to back up the fact that we're probably on the right track, here's um, something that Eric Evans, who kind of originated DDD, Here's what Eric talked about um, at his 2015 Domain Driven Design Exchange session. He, he believed that despite the hype, and there admittedly is a lot of hype, this is another microservices talk, around microservices, they probably give us the best opportunity to properly, really, finally do real domain driven design. And we completely believe that. So this is what we're hopefully going to present to you now, is a kind of roadmap or a, or a, a means of approaching a, a way through domain driven design to get to the end result of having the right microservices isolated at the right kind of level with the right connectivity. Unfortunately, we are still getting this wrong. So we have seen DDD being misapplied in the context of microservices. And worse, we have seen important bits being completely ignored or overlooked. So knowing your bounded context is incredibly important for two reasons. A, it's where your models interlate. And B, it's where your boundaries and sharing lie. So Eric Evans mentions this during his talk in X DDD Exchange. So he says he's often seen people making too big a bounded context. So a traditional monolithic server application as one bounded context is just way too big. But let's just stop and think, why do we need smaller bounded contexts? As you'll see um, in later slides, bounded contexts are where your ubiquitous language apply and has a meaning. So smaller the bounded context, less generic the language be, and more precise the model. We're also going to extend this, and we'll see how approaching an even slightly involved collection of microservices, typically three, then you'll have to leverage, leverage your bounded context in order to organize your team. 
So let's just revisit some of the key areas of DDD. And we are going to take you through a design journey from one of our projects. So if you consider this as a pictorial representation of that journey, you can see the first steps are fairly straightforward. So it's just understanding the core concepts of DDD. But the next steps or the application of those core concepts, as you can see, it's quite slippery. So if you get this wrong, it can bring your project down. But once you get past these tricky steps, the final steps are usually overlooked, but they have the potential to take your project all the way to the top. So let's quickly talk about the core. So the core um, are things that probably everybody in the room, even if you've never had a DDD book or you've never been on the, the, the courses, training courses you can do or kind of involved yourself in any way with it, you're probably at least aware of the names and probably aware of, of the concepts at least. Um, and these are things that, that are probably the hard, maybe not the hardest to get right, but, but you know, there's, 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 they're concepts which keep delivering value no matter how long you kind of use them and apply them. And when you see them, when you know they're working, you can see it in your code. So you just read the code and the code is clean and it, and it makes sense to kind of human beings, not to you as a developer. So there's lots of bits of DDD, but we're picking out two bits. So number one is ubiquitous language. So ubiquitous language is ubiquitous. Everybody talks about it. But it's, um, as we're going to show, you know, it, we learned to use it more in, in, a, in a more subtle way and, and, and to gain more from it as we went through this process. But so the core concept for ubiquitous language for us is that as we're trying to model business concepts and we're, we're, you know, we're basing our success on the fact that we understand the business very closely and we're trying to model that business very closely, the domain experts, the people we're building the software for, understand most about that domain and they already have a language to describe that domain. So what we should do as developers is listen to that language and use that language. So not just listen to it and then go, right, they mean something else and write down what we think it means. We should use their language. And we shouldn't just use their language in our conversations with them. We should use their language in our code. So it's always said that there's two hard things in software development, one of which is naming things. If you're doing DDD properly and you're working with people who understand the domain for which you're trying to solve the problem, they've got names for half the stuff that you're trying to come up with names for. So don't come up with your new name. Use the name that they're using it for. And the second concept is hands-on modelers. So some people just say it mean that this like architect should, should code. Architect should code. So we, we all agree that. But what this means is if you, if you have people in the team who are listening to the ubiquitous language or trying to use that to kind of get their head around the concepts that they're trying to model, just trying to understand it in your head and maybe even saying it out loud, as Eric Evans has tweeted recently, is good. But you don't, until you try and build something with it, until you try and capture that in code, you won't really realize the full benefits. If, if it feels right, you can see it in the code. The code flows, the code reads. And you don't get that unless you write the code. So there's people doing the modeling should be writing the code. And the people who are writing the code should be doing the modeling. So they should be, you know, it should be a, a massive overlap. So now that we have had our foundations, let's take a step forward. So the most dangerous thing in microservice implementation is to get your decomposition wrong. But what's less painful is not to decompose enough. Because you can always go splitting further and further until you get to the right size. But moving functionality from one place to another because you got the split wrong in the first place can be even more painful than implementing a monolith. But DDD can help us in this area. That's why anyone who knows it mentions DDD and microservice in the same breath. But before we get to the bounded context, there are some important bits that we need to cover. And we'll get there using our case study. Our case study is shared payment service. This provides an ability for our clients' customers to pay for and subscribe to their products online. It also provides them means to pay for these purchases using different payment methods, such as credit card, debit card, direct debit, and other online payment methods. It uses a commerce system built on top of its content management system to provide UI for checkouts, product management, and other admin capabilities. And then it uses a payment gateway to handle the uh, transactions. So 
without having the need for us to be PCI compliant. So we don't store any credit card or debit card details. Um, we just get the authentication token from the payment gateway. And finally, payment and subscription processing system. Now this integrates the commerce system with the payment gateway. It also stores, manages, and publishes the subscription and payment information to other enterprise information systems, such as CRM and data warehouses. That's Joe from the integration team waving us hello. With this overview, we can see how different systems implemented using different languages need to communicate with each other using their own APIs in order to achieve something. So at this point, we're going to bring in our next DDD concept. So again, it's the concept of, of the models and domain models. So again, it's probably familiar to most people. But there's, there are subtleties, again, which, which sometimes people miss around about DDD models. And that the, the one that we want to bring out here is that they're an abstraction of the real world. Sometimes people get carried away with modeling the real world um, to make it completely precise and accurate. Whereas we're not trying to build a model of the real world in all its complexities, what we're trying to do is build a model of the real world to solve some to solve some specific problems. So here, you know, the the, the domain that Gayathri's illustrated, you know, the, the 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 domain is to kind of payment and process uh, pr process payments and subscriptions. So during our first attempt at modelling in this payment service project, we identified five key entities within the shared payment service. The first one is payment. So this is the actual payment a customer makes for every purchase he makes, or as an initial payment toward a, payment towards a subscription. Next one is subscription. And this entity represents all the information related to a subscription, such as the product the customer is subscribing to, um, the amount that he needs to pay for, and um, the starting date of the subscription, frequency, number of payments, etc. And then it's the mandate which stores the recurring payment details. And if you recall, we don't store any credit card or debit card information, so we just store the authentication token. And this is the entity that holds that value. Plus, it also shows the um, recurring payment method and the recurring payment amount as well. And then it's the order. So this is the commerce order created by the commerce system uh, for every purchase the customer makes. And then finally, it's a refund. So as the name indicates, it's a refund that uh, the customer can cla uh, claim against an order as a whole or for individual line items. And this picture shows the relationship between these entities so it's important to note that not all of these are physically represented within the shared payment service. Some of them are just logical. So with that in mind, it's time to bring in aggregates. So aggregates are something that, that we found fundamental to, to, to well, to fundamental just if, even before microservices came along to kind of understanding groups, large subsets, kind of significant subsets of our models. Um, but when microservices became a big thing, aggregates became far more important. But yet we're surprised that we don't see them discussed in as much detail as other aspects of domain-driven design. So the, again, there's lots of concepts of aggregates which, which, you know, which you can bring to bear, but the things that we want to focus on here is the fact that an aggregate is a collection of one or more entities and maybe zero or more value objects, which are just kind of like DTOs and things. Um, which live together. So, they're, they're, so the, the, the rule of thumb is typically if, from the point of view of your system, the problem you're trying to solve, an aggregate, the, the bits in the aggregate will be probably created together, will go through a variety of state changes together, and will die or be destroyed together. Um, and so that's, that's key. And so therefore, around about them is typically what you'll, when you've built a system, you will discover is like a transaction boundary, um, and you'll also have things which will work within the aggregate to maintain the, the state of the various pieces of that aggregate altogether. The other thing is, and this is, this is key, and this is one of the things when you read the Domain Driven Design book, 
which was written well before microservices ever came about, you'll hear things discussed, such as an aggregate shouldn't be distributed across multiple systems. An aggregate should live, all of the pieces of it should live together on one host. So you can have multiples of that host, but they will all live together. You don't want one part over this machine over here and one part over here. And so that's the, that's the bits we want to pull out of aggregates at the moment. So let's see how it maps to our system. So based on the five key entities we identified earlier, we could derive at least two aggregates out of them. But we're just going to focus on one aggregate, which is the subscription. And as you can see, subscription is the root of this aggregate. What this diagram sh also shows is that it has a one-to-many relationship with mandate. But what it doesn't show is that a subscription can only ever have one active mandate at any point of time. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship. And that's the invariant we are going to impose on this aggregate. Now, I've got a very interesting story to share about this. So if you consider uh, a flow, user flow, where a customer wants to change his recurring payment method from credit card to debit card, the commerce system initiates a call to the payment and subscription system so that it can call the payment gateway to change the recurring payment. Now, subscription being the root of this aggregate means any handle to the active mandate can only be obtained through subscription. So a commerce system passes as a reference to subscription. And the payment and subscription processing system then looks up its persistent store, gets the active mandate. It then triggers a call to the payment gateway, which cancels the old mandate, creates a new one, and then activates it. But we hit a snag here. User experience being higher priority meant we had to go down the route of creating a new one activate it, and then cancel the old one. Now, these are multiple calls to the payment gateway. And as with any distributed systems, they are bound to fail, right? So if we assume that it's failing while the cancellation is in progress, so there is a chance, however remote, that there can be two active mandates at the same time. Now, that's clearly a violation on the invariant. So how did we get around this? We introduced an intermediate status within payment and subscription processing system, because that's the integration layer and un under our control. And we moved the failed mandates to that status. We then created a housekeeping service, which, if you recall, the designated framework mechanism from the aggregate definition, which would pull these failed mandates, retry the call to the payment gateway, and then move it to the appropriate status. So the thought for this comes directly from the DDD book, where it says apply consistency rules synchronously within aggregate boundaries and asynchronously across. So the next concept we want to highlight is, is not a DDD concept. So it's context, not bounded context yet. But context is, is a concept which we're all aware of because we communicate. And, and I'm sure everyone's heard the phrase, if, if someone says something and it's taken out of context, which means the words you said have a different meaning when someone interprets them in a different context from the one that, that you thought you were in or you were in when you made, those, made that statement. And that applies very directly um, and grows into the boundary context concept. Um, so we can see an example of it here. So to explain context, well, in the context of our shared payment service, let's just consider three flows. The first one is when a co customer makes a one-off purchase of a product from the online system. So the commerce system creates an order, and then it calls the payment and subscription processing system to uh, make a payment through pay payment gateway. Now, the payment gateway understands only payment. It doesn't care about order. But the integration layer, which is the payment and subscription processing system, it needs to know about both order and payment. If we consider another flow where the payment and subscription processing system needs to set up a recurring payment, uh, it calls the payment gateway and it creates what's called a continuous authority account in payment gateway. Now, this is called subscription and mandate within the integration layer. And you might ask, why, why are you having two different entities? Why can't you just have continuous authority account here? Because we want to provide an ability for the customer to change the recurring payment without having to touch the subscription. So that's why we identified two entities there. And finally, refund. So that's a term that commerce system uses to allow customer to claim a refund. But then in the payment gateway ter terms, it's just negative payment. So as we can see, our entities mean completely different things in different contexts. 
Uh, hang on. Let's show again. And she doesn't look happy because she has just spotted two entities which look quite similar. So if we just examine order and payment, you can see there are some attributes which are the same, such as product, quantity, price. But then there are some attributes which are quite similar, such as type and status. For example, status in order terms is just checkout or refunded or fulfilled. Whereas for payment, it is settled or settlement failed or authorized. And then same goes for type. So they are just completely different. Uh, even though the names are similar, what the values they hold are completely different. And also there are some attributes which are completely different. For example, order has line items, which payment doesn't. And payment has a merchant reference, which is a unique reference handed out by the payment gateway as a reference to the payment made. As you can see, now our model looks broken. So finally, we get to bounded contexts. So bounded context is just domain-driven design's formalization of the, this concept of context, this context, concept of the fact that the same words can have different meanings in different kind of areas, and different words can have similar meanings if you come at them from different areas as well. The bounded context is where domain-driven design encourages you to draw a strict, firm boundary around aspects of your model, which which separates your model into different pieces, and then within each of those bounded contexts, you have an explicit different ubiquitous language which applies, and therefore this solves this problem and gives you a lot more richness in your, in your model. So we'll see that happen now. So we go back to our context, and we'll see if we can solve the order payment broken model problem. So what we initially tried was to have order and payment at the same time, but that didn't look clean and it caused more confusion. And then what we did was to merge them together, but that didn't work out either. So what we ended up doing was splitting these into multiple bounded contexts, and we gave them proper names. So now the Commerce system is called Order Management System, and it has order and refund within its core model. And likewise, payment and subscription processing system has payment, subscription, and mandate as part of its core model. And likewise for payment gateway. But you can also see order management system has payment outside there. That's because they both communicate using APIs, so they can't be completely oblivious of each other's models. But just enough to communicate, but not enough to make it part of their core model. So with this in mind, this is the last concept we want to bring in, in in this kind of central section, the slippy bit. So context maps are very simple. Context maps are the, the making explicit of the fact that you've got multiple models because you've got multiple bounded contexts. What you want to do in able to, to be able to orient your team and yourself around these models, it pays to determine the relationships and explicitly mark them on your diagrams, and that's what context maps do. So we'll just quickly um, take a look at what context map looks in terms of our case study. So this is just, um, it shows different bounded contexts that we identified and split with their respective models. So we haven't shown the relationship between the entities within the bounded context, uh, but it's still there. So given all that, we haven't actually talked about microservices. So we have, however, talked about aggregates, and I've dropped some pretty, hopefully, unsubtle hints. So here's a zoomed-in version of uh, the yellow part, uh, one of the boundary contexts that we talked about up, to, up until now, and as you saw on the previous slide. So this is the payment and subscription processing bounded context, and you can see our subscription aggregate with subscriptions and mandates, and our payment aggregate with payments. Why do you care about aggregates? Because an aggregate is a pretty good starter for 10 microservice, in our opinion. Um, you might disagree with us, and you can ask questions at the end. Um, but it's as, as just based on the way we understand it and the way we approach it, it seems to, to be a very, very good match. So subscription aggregate is typically, we, we tend to identify things like that, and then we'll make pull out a subscription service from it. Payments aggregate, ditto for the payment service. But because I said starter for 10 microservices, it doesn't stop there. Um, oh, so the first thing, 
what we did was, so as, as, as we pointed out and we, we, we want to make explicitly clear, we're iterating all the time as we do this. So the first time we came up with the model was the one at the start and then we broke it down so we realized we had problems. This is us continuing to build things. So as we identified our subscription aggregate and had our subscription service and we're building on it and iterating it, ditto for the payment service, we realized that, that whereas our language, ubiquitous language may not have necessarily been been explicitly, you know, we had overlaps, we didn't have overlaps, but we were just, the, the languages didn't refer to each other. They were completely structured on their own. So they made sense on their own without reference to, to things from the, from the other aggregate. And it was at that point we realized that we probably had two separate bounded contexts going on. So then, and as, as Eric Evans pointed out, you know, this is a really good opportunity to split your bounded context down to make things really specific, make your models really, really clear because then you start to see all the benefits. So we did this. We, we realized there was two bounded contexts where we thought there was one, and we split them up. The other thing that we realized afterwards, after we'd done it, was that we'd struggled for ages to come up with a really good name for the bounded context, and we'd had to put the word and in it. If you have to put the word and, again, listening to the ubiquitous language, you've probably got two things. So we should have, for ages, we should have figured this out, but we didn't. So again, we should have taken our own advice and listened to the language. And then we would have found, found this out straight away. But as I said, so it's not always the case that those are your only microservices. Gayathri mentioned when we were talking about subscriptions and maintaining the, the state of subscriptions, sometimes it makes sense to, um, to pull the management and the, 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 the kind of framework mechanism, as Gayathri said, of the management of the kind of aggregate state into a separate microservice. Sometimes it pays to keep it in the same one, but for, for scalability and kind of uh, maintainability reasons, we pulled it out into a separate service. But because it didn't have any model elements of its own, it didn't bring in any other domain concepts, this microservice lives completely in it and, and, and fully within the subscription processing context. But there's other types as well. So there's also reporting services. And reporting services is something, for example, that Sam Newman talks about significantly. Because again, it's a thing where people kind of tie themselves in knots and they're not sure where they sit and whether they should split them out or where they shouldn't. We split them out all the time. It just seems to work all the time. But this reporting service here, you can see it's in a separate bounded context. It's got a reporting context, just because we didn't want to put too many words on the slide. So it's a separate entity, separate mic service. But because it, it to do to create its reports, it needs to know about a vast amount of the kind of core model from the payment processing context. It overlaps with that context. But it also needs to have a version of the model which represents kind of the, the structure and format of the reports that it needs to create. So that's, that is something that belongs to it and it alone. So this is the first taste of something we're going to talk about in the third part, which is the strategic patterns. This is a strategic pattern called shared kernel because there's no point having two things which are exactly the same. You just explicitly share those two things. So if we go back to this kind of evolving uh, kind of domain model, uh, albeit in high level, as Gayathri pointed out, but now you can see the various contexts that we've got going, the relationships between them, and uh, the, the kind of key entities that we've got in each of those. And so... We've talked about it obliquely as we've gone through this, but we wanted to pull it out because when we've, we kind of dry ran this talk for people in, in our company, they were like, it, 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 they weren't sure of all the steps that we've maybe highlighted. So we want to highlight them again. So what you should do is, when you start working on anything, you should start drawing a model. And it will be wrong, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't draw it. So start drawing a model and start coding it up. Step two, really, really, really pay attention to the language all the way through. But like it's, because it's, like I said, it's, it's the, one of the simplest concepts, but it pays off all the way through. Even things like, you know, use of and and all that kind of stuff. It makes a massive sense, ma massive decent, uh, difference. So listen to it and cultivate the model and change it when it doesn't work. Then at this point, start identifying your aggregates. They might, you know, it might disappear and they might turn out not to be and, and things might move, but it's a good point now to start identifying things like this. And then step four, when you hit pain points, and the language will tell you when you just, you know, when you can't explain things clearly to someone or the code just doesn't read, you know, it, like if you read it as if it's English pretending it's a DSL, it doesn't work. That's a clue. So when you hit them, split them into different bounded contexts. You know, like this is the, this is why everyone talks about bounded contexts because they're, they're awesome for this stuff. And then step five, at the end, like, like we pointed out when we split our payment and subscription processing, Pain is not the only reason to split things up. Sometimes it's just for utility and, and just to keep things clean and small and dialed down to the right level. So that's when, you know, you don't, 
you're not going to lose anything if you, if you drill things down to like a sensible level. So that's a good thing to do. So are we done? So obviously not. We have got 15 more minutes to go. But it seems DDD has got everything you need to, hand, uh, to tackle the hardest parts of uh, Microsoft's implementation. But what more can we want? Apparently, it turns out, DDD has got a lot more to bring to us um, in terms of tools and patterns to make our lives even more easier now that we have reached this point. We think these untold benefits uh, in terms of team organization is the real key to the success of any microservice implementation. Let's just take a quick look at the ones that are commonly overlooked. So we go back to our context map, but this time you have some more new information in there. So let's just quickly discuss what um, we did and how we define boundaries around other parts of application. So if you take backlogs, so we shared one backlog between the order management system or the commerce system and the payment and subscription processing system because we had like business user stories, so we had to combine the ba backlogs into one, but then we split into technical tasks between these two teams. And then code base, there was one for the commerce team or the order management system. I should stop saying commerce system. So um, one for order management system and one per microservice within the payment and subscription processing system. And we assumed there would have been one on the payment gateway side. But as you'll see, we had absolutely no visibility on the payment gateway side. And uh, database, so even though we use the same type of database, we had one instance separately for order management system and one for payment and subscription processing system. And finally, we'll look at the uh, most important, but and also often overlooked, the various inter-team relationships, which comes into play whenever you have more than one bounded context in play. So this is, I don't, it's not in my edition of the book, but I drew it when I did the, the Domain Driven Design course because someone put it up on one of the slides. And this really, really helped me kind of get my head around what the, you know, or just, just kind of put the, the basic strategic patterns, which are all about organizing people and teams. It helped me figure out kind of where they lived and, and, and their relationship between each other. And so the axes are key. So on the, the X axis along the bottom, it's like the increasing communication commitment and capability of the teams. So if you want to use a pattern that's, that's at the far right, you, need, you know, the teams need to be able to, to work as closely as possible together. On the y-axis, you've got the control over the associated teams, because you might be able to speak to them a lot, you know, like they're on Slack, but if, they're, you know, if you can't put stuff on their backlog, then maybe you're down the bottom. Um, and so with this in mind, you can see shared kernel is something we've already mentioned. The shared kernel was being, it was the, the, you know, we were top right because we were the same people. The guys who wrote one of the microservices were also writing the reporting microservice. So we had, you know, we could check out this, we could just talk to the guy sitting next to us or whatever. And that's, we had that pattern going. But what else did we have? So this is what we're going to cover in the last 11 minutes. Less than that, I can't do maths. Um, we, we saw, and we, to begin with, to be honest, we kind of semi-explicitly did this to begin with, and then when we looked back, we realized we were doing it, and we kind of started applying more of the patterns that, that told us what to do. But so we saw instances of anti-corruption layer, customer supplier, and partnership. But there's another quick concept to introduce before we talk about that. You've seen the, the interrelated bounded context, the context map, and you've seen the lines that, that join them. Each one of those lines indicates the fact that there's a relationship, and the relationship is frequently not kind of equitable. So upstream, downstream is the concept where one party is upstream and they have power, whether they know it or not. So if they make changes, it will affect the downstream team, whereas the downstream team has less power. And it might be a lot less power, it might be slightly less power. But you know, knowing the fact that there are these dynamics in the relationship is key to kind of understanding the application of these patterns. Because when you apply them, there's always an upstream and a downstream partner. But so bringing that into, in, in, uh, into mind, partnership is the first one that we talk about. So partnership is a pattern when neither party can succeed without the other party. So it, you, know, you could ignore the other team, the, other, the people who are working in the other bounded context, but if you do, you won't succeed your project. You, know, you won't deliver the thing you need to deliver. So therefore, you know, you, you, it's in everybody's interest to work really closely together. So we saw partnership um, in our project on when the order management system was uh, 
calling the payment service, as you can see there. So then this is a kind of a little tiny bit of one of our sequence diagrams. And so the example here is the, um, when the order management system would call create mandate on the um, subscription system. So therefore, because we were completely designing our aspect of the system, so we're the, the subscription team in this, at this point, um, we controlled our domain model, we completely controlled our APIs. So we wanted to make it as clean for us, but also the APIs clean for the, the guys in the other team who were actually working in Drupal. We, it was in everyone's interest. If they can't create mandates, um, then you can't subscribe to stuff. And if we don't have anyone using us, then it's kind of irrelevant. So it was in everyone's interest to, to work really closely together. So we saw that partnership in, in effect when we would stand around a whiteboard and we do domain driven design. And we wouldn't know whether something felt right or felt wrong. We'd go and get the guys from the other team who happened to be two cubes away and ask them what they thought. And they could tell us. And so they were doing the design with us. And we were kind of incorporating that in, in to, to what we were doing. We um, also, we uh, had you know, common things like, so we had test harnesses in our CI CD tool chain that, that made sure that when we had built something and built an API, we didn't change it and break their stuff and all that kind of thing. So the next one is customer supplier. So this is similar to partnership, um, whereby you know both parties need the other one to exist, but it's the power is slightly transferred towards the uh, supplier, right? So you know the customer doesn't get it's not a bespoke system, so they don't get exactly what they want, but they need to kind of pay off heed to the the customers who are the downstream people. So here, customer supplier is between the subscription service and the order management service. And you can see it here. So this is where, so because it was slightly complicated, um, there were instances where we would call back. So at the payment, uh, or the, yeah, in this case, the payments processing service would call back into the order management service, their API, to create orders and update orders. Um, so in that case, because they were based on the CMS and they were using a kind of out of the box commerce platform, there already was a domain model. So we couldn't affect the domain model. But they also could create an API which we called. So th we worked with them, and we didn't have complete control over the model, but we could help control the API and give them feedback. So what typically happened was we'd again do design with them, but, but then they'd kind of take that away and go and do more design to figure out how they could map that on to make it work. And the last one's the anti-corruption layer. So the anti-corruption layer is where um, there's a model that's upstream, which you have no control over, but you don't want to be corrupted by. You want to keep your model clean. You want to keep your model independent, kind of suited to your purposes and not suited to the purposes of this, this upstream team over which you have no control. So you can probably guess where this one is. Anti-corruption layer is where the payment service or the subscription service called the payment gateway. So the payment gateway was a third party service. It existed before we started. It is going to exist long after we've decided to swap to another payment provider. Um, they don't care about us. I think we, it, it was very hard for us to like, even ask them questions. So we just read their documentation and then like, built our thing. So we built an explicit layer in our software, in, in the microservices, which talked to this element to you know, tr explicitly translate to their requests and from their requests back into our domain model. So our domain model made sense to us. It was kind of generic. But, but generic, but in the regards to the payments, but specific to us for what we wanted to build. And then we translated it into whatever terminology they were using. And so that's us. So, um, so that's what we want. What we want to, to do, you know, there's lots of bits of domain driven design, but we, we definitely want to encourage you to not stop at the bit where you've done the kind of your boundary context. There's lots of extra bits that can massively make your life easier if you keep going, keep reading the book past chapter 13, which make your life easier. So to sum up, what are the lessons we learned from our case study? So first thing, and we have mentioned this over several slides, is that get the split correct in terms of microservices. Otherwise, it'll be so painful that you'll wish you had gone down the monolithic route. But. Don't worry too much, because all the information that you need is out there. We just need to be open to receiving it and then use it in our ubiquitous language. And then don't forget the strategic design patterns, which are important to organizing your teams around these services. 
And finally, there's just so much more to this amazing approach to distributed systems development. So don't stop once you have seen some benefits, but just keep going. There's a lot more to it. And that's, that's the key point. So we, we, you know, none of this is anything we've invented. We're just kind of talking to you about how we've seen many benefits from doing it. So we would completely recommend that you go, there's training courses that you can go on around the world in domain driven design. We've both been on them and got brainwashed. Um, there's the book you can read, there's loads of other stuff because it's kind of spawned off CQRS and loads of other things and, and domain events and, and loads of other things. This stuff really, really works. When you're trying to figure out how to do microservices, this stuff works. So we, we can't recommend it enough. So it's, it's, it's nuanced and subtle and there's loads and it's one of those books that you kind of go back to over and over again and realize stuff you didn't even realize the first time around. We totally recommend you check it out. Does anyone have any questions? Spot on five minutes. And we're hiring. If you want to, to come and work with us. Has anyone got any questions? Hello, sorry, yeah, the guy in the purple shirt. I'm wondering, like, the, the approaches you mentioned and the benefits um, attached to them. From your experience, do they apply differently between green field and brown field projects? So that's good to go after we can answer this. So the question is, um, do the benefits that we see differ between greenfield and brownfield projects? Because the one we were doing was kind of brownfield, right? Yeah, so. it was. So like I mentioned, so some of them were already implemented using a different technologies. Well, so we're just migrating. Um, but we um, have other projects running, which are greenfield developments, and they have seen far more benefits. But unfortunately, we can't talk about them because of um, client confidentiality reasons. Uh, but they have, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so, so we, th th the real bit is because it's Greenfield, you don't, no one has already figured, you know, th there's always a language and, and you rarely see something that really just captures the language for your specific situation because someone's built it on a kind of generic platform that's reusable, so it won't have the subtlety of your exact problem. So if you're doing Greenfield and you're building, hand rolling lots of your own stuff, you can really do this and you can keep doing it and you can get, your code looks awesome. Your, everything has the right name. When we, you know, the, the point about people joining the team and people um, staying around for you know, like seven or eight iterations, then maybe going on to another project, that was the easiest I've ever seen that because, because the things were the right size. So Gary, Gary who said microservices are developer sized. They're the right size because you know, if you join and we can give you some work on, on like this microservice and the, 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 you know, it's just that piece of the boundary context, it's just that aggregate, you don't need to know about in detail tons of other stuff your kind of cognitive load is low as you build up a bit of knowledge and then you look at the context map and you can see the other pieces. When it's rich and you really get it right, it just helps. And so people, we had people who were like productive within a week, like properly, you know, pulling features and like building stuff. It was unbelievable. So we've actually, we've written about it. We've got more slides. If you want, we've blogged about it loads. So, because um, we're quite obsessed with this approach. So has anyone else got any questions? Someone had their hand up further at the back. I did, but I'm going to talk you up. All right, cool. All right. So we've got three minutes left, unless we don't need to. People are leaving already. But has anyone got any other questions? Right, cool. Thanks very Thanks much. Thanks for it.